Um, you pay no tax on any gains in that product. So uh, if you put $10,000 away in 2000 and it's worth $20,000 today and your child goes off to college and you pay that college $20,000 for tuition expense, living expenses, uh, books, other items that you have, um, boom, that $20,000 comes out tax-free. And what kind of limitations? I mean, it doesn't have to be graduate school or can it be graduate school? Uh, can it be, you know, both undergrad uh, and graduate? Well, that, that, that's a great question. You know, this is still bantered around a little bit. R really what it's supposed to be for is college, but colleges are secondary educational institutions. So I've talked to people who have kids that have gone to culinary school, um, some vocational yeah. colleges. Um, they can use the money for those things. It, what this thing was utilized for initially were grandparents passing money down to grandkids. Yeah. And years ago, you remember the old UGMA or UTMA yes. accounts that uh, everyone right. had? Uniform and also, gift to miners. Act. Right, and, and here, here's grandma's Pac Bell stock, here's grandpa's uh, Pacific Gas and Electric stock, which are great stocks, pay a dividend. Um, but if you sold them, you paid a tax. Yeah. And if you sold them you know, under the age 18, there's a kitty tax. But more importantly, the kid could go buy some Spanish fly with his new Ferrari his girlfriend <laughs> down in Tijuana. Um, the money was not controlled. This way, it's meant for a specific expense. And more importantly, the trustee or the person who gifts the money, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, controls the money. So buy and hold, if all four of us were brothers and someone didn't go to college, we could take his 529 and apply it towards someone else's college expense. Uh, I mean, it's sort of like that HSA, you know, the health savings account where you get a tax deduction and then it builds up tax free mm -hmm. as long as you use it for medical expenses. Right. Yeah, it, it, when it goes in, is it avoiding taxes at the time, like um, IRA? Or? Like actually, you get a tax deduction. Actually not. You don't, you don't get a tax deduction. Okay. So, um, so it's after tax I, dollars you put into the... After uh, tax dollars, and they grow tax deferred, though. So it's like a... Tax, it's like a Roth. Like a Roth. It's like, IRA. It's like a Roth. Is it tax deferred or tax free? It, that builds up. Because it, like when you use it for secondary education, you don't pay the taxes on the money. Right. It's tax okay. deferred build up. Okay. And, and the money comes out tax free. Tax free. Now, there are three states... That's even gooder. Now, I know this isn't a part of our yeah. broadcast, and Pennsylvania, Kansas, and Missouri allow you to take Love a state, yeah, take, <laughs> they allow you to take a state um, deduction for uh, mm -hmm. contributing to a 529, but it doesn't affect California. If you go to their state university. Yeah. California's oh, yeah. bill will give you any kind of deduction. Well, no, know. no, California does not. So it, now, the, the we thing, don't believe in edumacation. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, uh, the, the, the struggle has been that, that people don't understand how these work or how to get them, and they're, they're, you, know, you can get them from your advisor, you can get them from any local broker dealer. And really, what, what happened was states sponsored these things. So you have the state-sponsored 529 plan. So fund companies contracted with states to manage the money. That's what gets confusing. Like, you, you know, you pick any fund company out there in the complex. It could be an index fund or a managed stock fund. It's like, well, I'm with this company. Well, no, that company's based in this state. It could be state. You, your, your 529 could be specific to the state of Missouri. It doesn't matter. You can go to school anywhere or live anywhere and still contribute to that 529. And that's what's confusing for a lot of people. It's like, hmm. well, who am I with and what's going on? It just doesn't matter. And then grandma and grandpa can uh, decide where to invest the funds, right? Be it, uh, there are certain investments, yeah, there's certain investment choices in there. And the big thing is you can't buy, buy individual securities. You can go into a, a spot where you can be totally allocated towards securities or totally allocated towards bonds if you want to. Uh, but the other thing that, that most people dealt with were these age-based portfolios. And that's where a lot of confusion came up, especially around 2008. Uh, even if you're enrolled in college and of the age of maturity, like let's say you invested in the 2012 fund when these first came out, and now it's 2012 and the market drops 10%, your funds will drop 10% even though you're in college, the money's still invested. People say, oh, gee, once you hit the age of maturity, when you're supposed to go to college, the money's all in cash or it's all in bonds. Not true. It's still invested if it's in those core portfolios. And that's a big mistake a lot of people make. Hmm. So we're talking about 529 plans, and you said they're similar to a Roth IRA, meaning you make contributions, and the money is supposed to be used for, for education, and it can grow in there tax-free if it's used for education. Can you set up an account with, like, for example, I have a Roth IRA account. Can I go to that company, the custodian, and do they do 529 plans, or is it a, who do I have to go to to set up a 529 plan? Well, I have to be completely compliant, so you have to talk to your tax advisor before making any decisions. But, um, <laughs> You cannot roll over a, a Roth IRA into a 529 plan, right, no, but, but you can talk to the same provider. Yeah, yeah same provider. Talk to the same provider, but you can't take the Roth money and put it into a 529 plan. Yeah, no, so, yeah. so I guess do, do most 
most companies, if they can set you up in an IRA or be it a Roth or whatever, can they also do 529 plans? I, I guess that's for the most part, yeah. Most, oh, okay, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. I was confused yeah. about the state sponsorship and whether you had to do it through some state of California website or something. Really, you, you can. Uh, the The best resource is SavingForCollege.com because oh, okay. they have a listing on every single 529 plan. They also cover the Coverdale Savings Account, which we don't need to go into. Um, right now, it's another form of saving for college as well. But that that website again, savingforcollege.com, is a great resource to research anything that's been offered to you or any ideas you might have on 529 investing. Okay, we're in studio with Lou Butmall, who's a registered investment advisor, and uh, we're going to cut to commercial. We're going to cut to a commercial break. When we come back, Lou's going to still be in the studio here. We're going to get into other retirement type vehicles. Uh, here is the first trivia question: Laverne and Shirley was a spin-off of what TV show? Oh, oh, the, oh, 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 hold on, don't answer yet. And don't touch that dial because we are going to be right back. Excellent. Awesome. Good job. Good. Good, Good for a second. Yeah. Good. Okay, you guys ready? Yep. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hoff of Pacific Private Money, Robert Chip of RPM Mortgage. I'm just going down the list here. And Lou Botmall, who's a registered investment advisor. When we cut to the first commercial break, we ask this trivia question. This is uh, TV spinoffs is the theme. Laverne and Shirley was a spinoff of what TV show? Mark, One, two, three hey. o'clock, four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, go ahead and answer. Happy days. Correct the mundo, yeah. as they, as the Fonz would say. <laughs> All right, and uh, Lou, one of the reasons again I wanted to have you in the studio here was because I received an email from uh, a listener who said, you know, I'm, I'm age sixty and I lost a lot of money in the stock market from 2008 to 2010, and how do I go ahead and recoup that? Now, Mark and I were talking off, off air that, you know, I'm 52 and a third. So um, do you have any re advice for us, 52 and a third? <laughs> yeah, right. And, and also the 60-year-old, uh, what, what kind of retirement advice do you give? Well, it, it's, um, first of all, it's challenging. I respect um, everyone's participating in the market and what's happened. Um, I'm concerned like you are. As an advisor, it's tough talking to clients on, on a daily basis who have lost money, uh, you know, with some investment decisions that didn't work out and uh, you know we're all we're all in this together so you know my encouragement first of all is to start talking to people not family members <laughs> but, but <laughs> advisors and other people I um, saw the paper this week that there was a poll of who plans on retiring at age 65 and like 74 percent of the respondents said they were not oh yeah that, that's to. unbelievably yeah, that, high that goes, percentage that goes right to the point I mean really when yeah, it comes what, to what percentage of them had a job I, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of them had to go back to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, the, this, this idea of a retirement plan, especially after the age of 60, I mean, let, let's face the facts. And, you know, the the economy is not lying to us right now uh, with very low interest rates, very low CD rates. There's not a lot of secure investments out there that people are used to and say, well, geez, if I just park this in the bank or in this single investment, I'll receive a nice income. Uh, for those who have lost money, the big thing is this. If you're going to live three years, don't worry about it. If you're going to live 25, <laughs> just have fun. sorry, got to be direct. Yeah, right. well, yeah. you, you know what? You make a good point. It's not just the fact that people lost money, but interest rates are so low that it's not that they can afford to just have X amount of dollar unless you're, you know, got a couple of billion dollars just sitting around in a one percent account. That's that's fine. And that, that goes directly to my point. It it, it really is a, a function of getting a plan together. You know, how much am I going to get in Social Security? Do I have a Medicare supplement? Uh, you know, what am I going to retain my home? Am I going to travel? What extraordinary expenses could occur? Do I need a new roof, a new car eventually? All these things will come up. But the biggest thing we just joked about here, 53 and a half or 59 or 69 or 78 nowadays is people are living longer. So the, the struggle is this. People are used to the sunset provision that everyone who has a firefighter, police officer, or government employee relative, oh, you just flip a switch and you retire. The income turns on and are all ready to go. Yeah. Us as individuals now who are responsible for our own retirements through this 401k program we have or other retirement vehicles are really stuck with how much money do I have and what can I do to make it last as long as possible. Well, I've, I've already done my plan. I figured out I, I can retire at 147. <laughs> perfect. So it's like my friend said, his life was perfect as long as he died in the next 18 months. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, that's why the, the popularity of all these programs for, you know, how to make money on the side, yeah, everything from multi-level marketing to, to just, you know, how to get in business for yourself, how to do something entrepreneurial for extra income, how to make money on the internet. I mean, there's, that's the stuff has never been more popular than it is today for that very reason that uh, we're trying to catch up 
you know, those of us whose 401ks, as people like to say, turn into 201ks, or right. our real estate portfolio is not what it used to be, and we're all looking around for ways to make I, I mean, I, I figured I could make a lot of money by uh, taking out a life insurance policy on myself. <laughs> but then I realized that I can't be my own beneficiary, and no, that wouldn't work too well, would it? No, you cannot. It's, no. it's unfortunate. I mean, and, and really the, the key is this, is that if you participate with those that are participating in the economy, you will eventually, not immediately, eventually with patience, be rewarded with investment returns that mimic the economy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the big step that everyone forgets. Everyone wants to be in the market one day, out the next. Geez, if it's going up, I'm happy. Like this week, at the end of this week, I should say. Yeah. You know, a few weeks ago, oh, I'm extremely upset and frustrated. That's not investing. What, you know, that's tactical investing, which is a whole other conversation we have another time. But really what it's about is, is sticking with the plan, sticking with those companies that are going to be around, that people are going to do business with. We're going to brush our teeth. The lights are on. Oh, my goodness. We, you know, those are two people we're going to be working with in the future, no matter what happens to the economy. And maybe invest there or work with an advisor and say, well, geez, I can't risk all my money, but maybe my allocation should be set differently. Like, you know, if I have $100,000, I can't go below 50. You know, if I go below 50, I'm really going to have a problem. Okay, well, then let's take, you know, 40 or $50,000 and put it in some type of income producing asset that works for you. And then take the other 50 invested maybe in dividend producing securities or other things that aren't super risky but will provide some return and participate in the economy because the bad news here is costs are going up. Yeah. Interest rates are going to change. And if you don't prepare yourself, it's going to affect you down the road. What kind of income investments do you like nowadays? Um, well, on the on the, if you're in a taxable account, um, you know there are municipal bonds, um, both on a federal level. You know, bonds that are located around, around the United States. There's uh, bonds located here in the state of California. Most are worried about um, the fact that California doesn't have a great balance sheet right now, which is very true. Yeah, but it's like, sort of like Chrysler. You know, when they were having big problems in the late 70s, I, I remember telling my dad, you know, he was worried about, you know, because I said, hey, I think we should buy Chrysler. Because I, I can't imagine the government letting them go bankrupt. There are too many employees. Same thing with California. You know, I don't think the federal government's going to allow the entire state of California to, to default on its general obligation. Well, but what about individual individual municipalities? I can say that. Yeah, that. Well, that's well, the well, one we, that's we have the news at Stockton this week, and yeah. that, that's a headline. That's a headline that's going to be thrown in everyone's face for a while. Why invest in munis with this problem? So, Lou, why'd you bring it up? Well, one of the main reasons is this: um, by mandate, the money that comes out of the treasury of the state of California has to go pay off municipal interest first before it does many other things. Mm -hmm. So, before people get paid their paychecks as government employees. Municipal bond interest gets paid. So you're pretty general obligation bonds. General obligation yeah, bonds. And also some city bonds. bonds. Now, okay. granted that, that Stockton's a problem. Um, other communities mm -hmm. like Stockton have had issues. But by and large, there's a lot of, you know, one quote a lot of managers use is I don't buy anything that's outside of seven miles of the coast of California. Because that's older real estate in places where people are going to pay their taxes uh, for mm -hmm. keeping the water on, keeping the uh, toilets well, flushing. Well, Vallejo did file bankruptcy. Yes. Um, and I haven't really followed it recently. But, you know, yeah, I don't know what anyone, happened with that. It yeah. still exists, right? Vallejo still exists? <laughs> yeah. I know I drive through. I it think I drive through, through it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, Vallejo does exist. Stockton's going to exist. They're going to refinance themselves and come back, you know, hopefully financially stronger. The big key is this to remember. Um, talking to municipal managers, and I had a conversation with a couple last week. Look at what happened in San Jose on Election Day. Okay. What, Look, hap what happened? What, what's on that? <laughs> the, the pension reform bill that got passed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone talks about the unfunded pension commitment sure. by municipalities and the reason not to buy municipal bonds. And let me tell you, there is a storm brewing across the country, um, and we're all responsible for it. You can't. It, you can't. You, you're responsible. I'm not well, responsible. No, can't, here, here, here's, here's my point. I'm, I'm being too. Me. I'm, I'm, I'm being too serious. You're talking to me. I'm being too serious here. But but in the in the end, you know, retirement benefits have increased over the last 20 years with a great record market. Now the market's not doing so well, and they're going back saying, "Hey, we got to reduce benefits." Everyone's like, "It's a contract. It can go up. It can't go down." Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, ridiculous. that's so so. I think uh, I read somewhat. It was it Rhode Island had another referendum? Uh, other states and and what, what they're saying is. Stay tuned. Like Obamacare, this is going to change. So well, just, like, just like Social Security, I mean, I honestly do not count on that for when, you know, they'll they'll change the dates. You know, they'll change the fact that you know if you have more than three dollars in your account, I'm sorry, you're rich. You, well, you're not going to. I mean, something's going to change because you can't just you, 
can't just keep Well, when they on. started Social Security at the retirement age of 65, I think that was the life expectancy for people. Right. So if they so had gone back to what its original plan was, you wouldn't be getting it till you were 70 or 75. And or 85. If it clicked right. in up to 100,000, which is probably like John Beresford Tipton's millionaire at the time, the Social well, Security yeah, would I mean, go I, up to a million. Well, I had a client who, uh, his, her, excuse me, her husband died in 1961. And he probably put in maybe three thousand dollars in the whole system, and she was taking out a thousand dollars a month, wow. and she lived till she was hundred and one. Right. I mean, and, and you know, God love her and all that, but she had all the money in the world. She didn't need Social Security, and yet look what happened. I mean, that was a great investment. Yeah, <laughs> what, yeah for, for us. Yeah, that, that, yeah no, well, no, that, no, that's yeah. that's really that's really where it worked. And, and what the the problem that we're faced with right now is. Um, you know, not to be an actuary, is the number of people receiving Social Security. That's really the, the overhang on the government, is that there's 72 million people that are going to receive it, almost and, a third of our population. And they're going to be collecting it for a longer time than right. these rich right. that, That's it right in the It wasn't last year the first year that they had not done the increase, cost of living. But it's not just yeah. the retired people. You know, there, there are a lot of people who are getting Social Security who, you know, haven't put quite as much into the system. And, you know, obviously you got to take care of the widows and orphans, but there are a lot of people who take advantage of that. You know, that there, there can be. I mean, back to retirement planning, to bring this point together, when you're looking at Social Security as your base income and layering, you know, your expenses and what you need on top of it, that's, you know, if you have $100,000, you need $1,000 more a month to live, you're going to have money for 8.3 years. If that same $100,000 earns 4% during that time frame, you'll go for 24 more months or 10 years. That's really what retirement planning is all about, understanding that your money will last longer in other places than the bank and CDs currently, and you got to implement those changes even though you feel uncomfortable. Uh, you invest when you're uncomfortable. You know, yeah. look at look.